right. So we are we are live. Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. It's good to see you all. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Faith in the Valley Justice Interview Series. Uh, my name is Reverend Bryce White, and I'm happy to be your um, your your lead conversationalist today uh, with a great guest from uh, Merced, Rabbi Shalom. Uh, so just a bit about Faith in the Valley and the Justice Interview Series, and then I'll read a bio of uh, Rabbi Shalom, and we will uh, move from there. Uh, Faith in the Valley and our community partners, we believe in a different and better future is possible for the Central Valley if we work together. A future in which everyone is included, treated as sacred, has a chance to thrive and, and live a healthy and decent life. A future in which no one is seen as less than or lives in fear because of the color of their skin, their legal status, their religious identity, or the amount of money they earn. A future where everyone has access to good jobs, clean air, clean water, alternatives to incarceration, quality health care, and safe neighborhoods. Faith in the Valley Justice interview series, there are a set of conversations uh, where we highlight the role of faith and justice in organizing in the Central Valley. Uh, we have discussed the role of interpretations of scripture and its role in doing justice, the intersection between um, religion and mass incarceration, Christian perspectives on abolitionism, conceptions of nonviolence, the revolutionary theology of Fannie Lou Hamer, Muslim religious and political orientations, anti-Asian violence, amongst other important issues. Uh, today, as I mentioned, we are talking with Rabbi Shalom of Merced about Jewish identity and interfaith work. A bit about uh, Rabbi Shalom Bachner, uh, who serves as the spiritual leader and director of education for Congregation Beth Shalom, the Center for Jewish Life in Modesto, and the greater Stanislaus County. Uh, Rabbi Shalom, as he prefers to be called, has been with Beth Shalom since 2013. He has a background in formal and informal Jewish education, including outdoor education, with more than 30 years of experience. Uh, Rabbi Shalom has a BA in Sociology and Judaic Studies from the State University of New York at Albany and an MS in Education from the College of St. Rose in Albany, New York. And he has traditional uh, rabbinic uh, ordination as well. Uh, Rabbi Shalom brings his musical talents and interests to his rabbinate and is a guitarist, a drummer, and a songwriter, so a multi-talented person. Mm -hmm. Uh, his other interests include hiking, downhill skiing, long distance bike riding, and modern music, including the Vermont jam band, Fish. He has previously worked at synagogues and Hillel's, including seven years directing Santa Cruz Hillel. He has directed and worked at residence and summer day camps, youth groups, congregational schools, day schools, and adult education programs. Uh, Rabbi Shalom's area of expertise is in presenting traditional, presenting traditional text and rituals in user-friendly, approachable, and interactive ways. He has experience and comfort working with the full range of Jewish movements and expressions. Rabbi Shalom is a compelling educator with extensive experience teaching and learning with adults, families, college students, and children of all ages. Rabbi Bachner is a native of Albany, New York, and is married to Shoshana Bachner and has two children, Nitsan and Yuval. Uh, welcome, Rabbi Shalom. It's such a pleasure to, uh, to be in conversation with you today. Thank you. It's great to be here. One quick clarification. While I love Merced, I am based in Modesto. Modesto, excuse me. I'm sorry. I caught that I, when I was uh, uh, saying, uh, speaking after that, I said, oh, I said Merced instead of Modesto. My two, two great cities that start with M. <laughs> it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I look forward to, to our, our, our continued interaction. Uh, if we can get started, uh, I'm going to ask the first question and Rabbi Shalom will engage us uh, in dialogue. So uh, Rabbi Shalom, you shared with me in uh, some of our prep uh, previous conversations that a part of your work is as a Holocaust educator. And so I would add two questions around that, that I would like to pose to you. Uh, the first, what is the central moral lesson or lessons that you want your hearers to take away from the Holocaust? And the second, um, the Holocaust is often used within American political rhetoric in ways that dismiss the horror of the event uh, in application as a you know, sort of you know, uh, applied to contemporary problems. 
Now, with that said, are there social and political parallels between what led to the Holocaust of European Jews and what we are witnessing socially, religiously, and politically in America today? So let's start with question one, and then we'll move to- Yeah, uh, very powerful questions, and there's a lot in both of those. Uh, first, let me tell you a little bit how I came to this work. In addition to being a, a trained Holocaust educator and frequently going into junior highs and high schools in the area, particularly when they're reading Diary of Anne Frank or studying about the Holocaust in history classes. This is not just a professional interest, it's a deeply personal one. My father, who recently passed away, was born in Berlin. The family fled after Hitler came to power, first to Czechoslovakia, and then ultimately arriving in the United States. So on my father's side, I'm a first generation American. Much of his family that was left behind in Poland uh, was murdered by the Nazis. My stepfather, who has been a part of my life, also passed away since I was um, a young child, um, is literally a survivor. His mother and sister were murdered by the Nazis. And so I literally cannot remember an age that I did not know about th these incidents. Um, and while it came to me in bits and pieces, um, these are incredibly important stories that I want to make clear are personal stories, not just history. Right. Um, in terms of what are the moral lessons, look, I, I think uh, even an hour is not enough time to cover that. I know there's other topics we want to get into, but let me mention four. Um, number one, the Holocaust represents truly the depth of human depravity, the awareness of what is possible, not only when people do evil, but much more importantly, when good people look the other way. Um, it's been said that there were really only um, a handful of, of types of people in the Holocaust, the victims, the perpetrators, the bystanders, and the upstanders. There were a tremendous number of victims. There were a very sizable number of perpetrators. An entire society went about murdering its neighbors and those in neighboring countries. There were millions of bystanders who literally just looked the other way and said, this doesn't impact me. And there were a handful of upstanders, mm -hmm. Jews and non-Jews, who risked their lives to save others. So we're dealing, this is all just point number one, not only with an incredibly disturbing recent example, we're talking two generations ago, of what is truly possible. When people say it's inhumane, no, it's incredibly humane to engage in mass murder, but also the potential for incredible decency and bravery and resistance. So point number one is it's in our hands. It's always in our hands. It's not in someone else's hands. We're not in charge of what happens to us. We're only in charge of how we respond. But that makes all the difference in the world. If we're talking about racism, we're talking about poverty, we're talking about what's happening in the Ukraine, it's truly up to us how we respond. That's point number one. Point number two, uh, Hitler did not create anti-Semitism, which by the way is a politically correct phrase for Jew hatred or oppression of Jews. It's literally been around for 2000 years. Right. It has political element. In fact, it's probably been around for more than 2000 years. Um, Jews were hated when we were the only monotheistic faith, thousands of years uh, before the time of Jesus. And we've unfortunately been hated by the other monotheistic faiths that developed from us due to religious, political and social tendencies, Jews have been the scapegoat of the world for literally thousands of years. So when people say, you know, why did Hitler hate the Jews? We may never know that. He certainly was not Jewish himself. I don't know where that ridiculous piece of misinformation began, but not only do we not know where it came from, we know that it preceded him by thousands of years. And we know that it didn't end in 1945. It's not like the Holocaust happened and suddenly the world became a safe place for Jews. Um, these are still present features of modern society, including in particularly in the United States, which has always prided itself as not succumbing uh, to these kinds of, of biases as a society, obviously with some clear exceptions in terms of slavery and ongoing racism in this country. Uh, so that's point number two, to put the Holocaust and its mass murder of people into a context that began before and continued way after. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, just a couple of stats that people simply don't understand. Um, there are, if you look at the world as, as a pie, 
look at the pie graph of the world, one third of the world is Christian. One fifth of the world is Muslim. So 53% of the pie of humanity is of the line of Abraham. But as compared to one third that's Christian and one fifth that's Muslim, one four hundredth is Jewish. Mm. It's a completely different fraction. We have always been a minority. We have often been a persecuted minority, and we have thousands of years of being uh, refugees and trying to find um, shelter after our, our homeland was destroyed by the Romans 2000 years ago. Of the Jews that lived in Europe uh, in the 1930s and 40s, that was the largest Jewish community on earth. Um, and we're talking about in, in cases like Poland, 90% of them murdered. Um, wow. What does it mean? What does it mean to be one four hundredth of the world? And 80 years ago, literally have a third of our people wiped off the map. Not because of not because of war, not because of disease, but because of hatred. And this was done by the most advanced society of its time, Germany, the most culturally and scientifically advanced country, literally two generations ago murdered two thirds of the Jews of Europe and one third of every Jew that lived in the world at that time. We have yet to replace those numbers. We probably never will. There were 18 million Jews before the war. There were 12 million after the war. There are now about 13 million Jews in the world, mostly in the United States and Israel. We are 0.2% of the world's population. And yet somehow this 0.2% of the world has been blamed for wars, uh, financial chaos, and even the weather, let alone disease, and basically everything that's plagued humanity, let's blame the Jews. So let's kind of let, let those statistics resonate. Fourthly, and I end with this one because I think it's, it's the proactive thing. It's all about education. It's all about letting people know the information that I shared in hours and hundreds of hours more of, of other information. Um, we're living at a time that the last of the um, witnesses, the survivors, are dying. They're in their 90s. We're the last generation that will hear from someone that saw this firsthand, which means that we will now need to become the witnesses of the witnesses. And we're not only living at a time that these people are, are passing away, but the increase in Holocaust denial or Holocaust apathy or as, and I'll come to your second question, the trivialization of the Holocaust is at unprecedented um, amounts. Um, the fact that 80 years later, people are saying, well, it didn't happen, or it wasn't 6 million people, it was, it was this number of people. Um, it did happen. I've been to the camps, by the way, the vast majority of which the Nazis destroyed because they wanted to leave no evidence of their war crimes. So you have to go to a place like Auschwitz-Birkenau, which the Nazis ran out of time and, and literally left it there, not because they wanted it left there, because they ran out of time. Um, or Majdanek, because the vast majority of these death camps, um, there were concentration camps, which were prisons, slave labor camps that literally worked people to their death. But then there were places that were designed to mass murder the Jews, the gypsies, the homosexuals, and the political dissidents of Europe. These are historical facts. And to think that one generation after my father and stepfather, I have to argue that these are real um, is on one hand full, makes me full of despair, but also leaves me full of hope when I go to these classrooms, I'm engaging in conversations like this, people listen, people get it, people decide, okay, I need to read another book, I need to watch another movie, I need to talk to a survivor or a child of a survivor, I need to go and see these things with my own eyes. Uh, I really appreciate um, appreciate is a poor choice of words, but to to hear the numbers because even myself, the way you frame the stark contrast, I think is really important for us to grasp the severity of of, of the Holocaust. One, I didn't know that ninety percent of Polish Jews were murdered. I didn't know that ninety. I knew that you know the, in a grand total that six million Jews lost their, lost their life in the Holocaust, but I didn't know that ninety percent of Polish Jews were um, were exterminated. You know, um, I, I did not know that. And, the, and to place that in the contrast with the total Jewish population on the planet, um, you know, it brings out just the, the, the brevity of it. And, and, and to contrast that with Germany as the most technologically, scientifically, and sort of culturally 
quote, advanced <laughs> society on the planet, but uh, operating, um, you know, in the way they did towards European Jews and in their colonial spaces uh, in Africa, you know, the way those two things merge around how yes. they affected extermination is, is, is mind, mind bending and, and needs to remain at the forefront of our consciousness so that we don't continue to repeat these things. Yes, and yes, which brings me to the really important second question that you've asked. Um, I, I want to, before answering it uh, fully, and maybe with, with more brevity than the first question, um, I just want to first comment on how inappropriate it is when people trivialize the Holocaust. Um, we're talking about the mass murder of entire communities. The, literally, the attempt to remove Jews from planet Earth, along with the Roma, the Gypsy people, along with others that Hitler literally thought were were not um, were subhuman. So when people say having to show my vaccination card is like the Holocaust, I cannot think of something more disgusting, because vaccination cards, whatever you think, uh, a wherever you are in the political spectrum, are there to save lives putting a yellow star on someone's clothing or stamping Jew in their passport was literally a way of dehumanizing them and leading to their death. So when people talk about mild inconveniences as like the Holocaust, uh, it's very hard for me to keep my blood pressure down and, and respond to that thoughtfully. But, but here's an example we're seeing in the last couple of days. Uh, Putin, who uh, has mastered propaganda has invaded Ukraine, a democratic sovereign nation, one claiming that Ukraine doesn't exist, it's part of Russia. Secondly, claiming he is denazifying Ukraine. The Ukraine is literally, at this point, led not, not only by an incredibly brave, heroic person who is standing with his people, um, he happens to be Jewish. There are no active neo-Nazi militias in Ukraine, and they're certainly not a factor of the government. So in, in, he, he is abusing history, as are other people when they make these analogies. And we need to know the facts, and we need to stand for them, and not let propaganda and lies determine the way that history unfolds. Um, the parallels are, are way too powerful to look, look away from. Mm -hmm. um, if one looks at Germany in the 1930s and remember that Hitler came to power through an electoral process, um, uh, we are looking, if you look at uh, Germany in the 1930s, the United States in the 2020s, rising tensions, inability for groups to listen to each other, let alone talk together, constant blame, blaming thing on refugees, blaming people on racial or, or, or sexual lines, violence. Uh, a, a proliferation of guns and violence and incredibly dangerous, hateful rhetoric coming in some cases from political leaders and political parties, not from the fringe, but right. coming from coming from um, particular sides of the political equation. Now, what does this mean in terms of what we're witnessing socially, religiously, politically today? Not only is it a wake up call, but some people never went to sleep. They're aware um, when, it's not that history repeats itself. History is a continuum. I mean, past, present, uh, tomorrow are separated by by mere hours. Um, and the, there's a very clear antidote to all of this. And it's not only education, but take that education and stand together. Know what is threatening us, if that's white supremacy, if that's hate, if that's violence and reach out to your neighbor before you need them and before they need you. Right. Learn about people of other ethnicities, learn about people of other religions and cultures and understand we're all human. The one thing that, that, that Hitler got so wrong and we're seeing that, that Putin is getting wrong as well, you, cannot, you can attempt to divide people into us and them. You can attempt to other people, but when people stand strong, and stand together, they are more powerful than, than that othering because our common sense of, of decency and humanity can ultimately overpower that. So I'll, <coughs> I'll end this <coughs> answer with this. My stepfather was a news addict. You can understand why when you flee as a child and don't see your family again and grow up you know, uh, in, in a world ravaged by war, you need to know what's going on. And he said, you know, he was interviewed a couple times about his experiences. And he said, you know, the important thing is to have hope, but also take action and to be aware. 
And I just think that those three are such guiding principles, but I'm going to say them in opposite order. Stay informed, be aware of what's going on, use that to take action and remain hopeful, remain positive, remain knowing that we can do this. We can overcome this. We've overcome it in the past. I know we can overcome it here in the United States. I believe we can overcome it everywhere, but it takes being informed and it takes action. No, that's right. Yeah, that, those are all all phenomenal, phenomenal points. And and the key around to me around being <clears throat> being informed also helps build a culture to refute um, the trivialization of uh, historic atrocities and how they still inform the world and shape the shape the world today. Um, so, but you know, if, if folks don't know, and this is why I'm so glad around how you framed even your work around being a Holocaust educator, because um, we are we are moving into an era where people really don't know, <laughs> you know. Be, you yeah. Know, so there's 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 the handful that deny yeah. these facts, but then there's a much more insidious problem of those that simply don't know the number of millennials of young Americans that don't know what Auschwitz is, that don't know what the Holocaust was, that cannot state the simple fact. The Holocaust was the systematic murder of six million men, women, and children, yeah. or the people who who blame the victim. And I mentioned this to a class of junior high students yesterday. They said, "What did it, the question was?" You know, they're young; they don't know. What did the Jews do that made Hitler hate them? Mm -hmm. And I said, "We have to stop blaming the victim. Uh, blacks did not cause slavery. Yeah. Gay people do not cause homophobia." Muslims do not cause Islamophobia. Jews did not cause the Holocaust. What causes it is ignorance. Yeah. So we got to respond to that ignorance with facts, <clears throat> which is why this is such an important conversation. If even one person learns one thing they didn't know, it's been time well spent. No, that's right. Yeah, I mean, even the middle the middle school child asking that question to your point is reflective of a society that shapes us in such a way to immediately kind of go towards well, what did the victim do to deserve their victimization, and that's a and that's a very sad sort of socialization process that this country that's rooted in this country that shapes children uh, in a way that sort of you know frames their imagination around siding with oppression oppression and oppressors rather than um than, than victims and the oppressed and so that's an undoing that needs needs to continue to take place it's a constant undoing I mean, and our language needs to really rise to the occasion um when someone says you know why is that person homeless that person is experiencing homelessness they're not inherently homeless right it's not something they did it's 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 a temporary state that is on us as society to fix it's our failing that's right not their, not their failing yeah yeah house of this is a, is a societal failing without yeah without question as is racism as is sexism as is all of these otherings exactly yeah and this is this is really rich I, I have a few more questions but i want um uh I don't want you to feel like you have to rush through the question <laughs> either, you know because i mean there's there's so much that is packed in i mean we could really just have sat with question number one you know, conversation number one the, the entire time. So feel free to sit with um, responses more if you if you feel inclined. Well, so then the one thing I, I will add, and um, because I know that a topic like the Holocaust can easily become a multi-hour answer to even a single question. I mean, for example, when my stepfather was interviewed, they said, tell me about your childhood. And the, the questioner never got in another question for an hour and a half. He literally just started talking the entire story of his life from childhood. So what brought him to that moment? Um, I would hope that people realize there are good resources out there. Um, and, and I don't just mean, you know, lis listening to me. Um, and, and unfortunately, the World Wide Web is full of great stuff and garbage, and you really need to know what to separate out. But sites like the American Holocaust Museum, which um, is in Washington, D.C., um, sites like uh, Yad Vashem, which is um, the Israeli Holocaust Museum, or, and I'd say even a great, a better starting, a decent starting point, the Anti-Defamation League, which has done amazing work about responding to all of these otherisms. Um, take a few moments, realize what you, you know, what you may or may not already know. And these, these three websites would be great starting places for what are some of the books, what are some of the movies. There are literally thousands of hours of testimony of people like my stepfather 
telling their story. Um, these, these are compelling narratives and um, avail yourself of them because the, it's getting hot out there. Mm-hmm. And we, we need to be able to know when it's too hot mm-hmm. and what actions need to be taken. We need to see the warning signs and they're, they're there for us because the events I'm describing were truly only 80 years ago. Yeah, that's right. And for, and for those who are listening, we're going to house this conversation um, on the Faith in the Valley web web page. And what we'll uh, I'll ask of Rabbi Shalom would be for him to send me those resources and we can place them in the description of the uh, of the conversation as well. That's great. What to, to tap into. Before I ask this other question, I don't want to derail the conversation myself, but uh, one of the pieces I think is important as a uh, as a uh, as a Christian minister for uh, my you know those who identify as Christian who may who may listen is that you know Christianity played a very central role in crafting anti-Semitism uh, uh, in, in, in the Western world. I think that's something that Christians have to continue to wrestle with and grapple with, and that there's been an emergence of many Christian theologians who are addressing that and some people you know they have different sort of analytical ways of talking about that historical reality but the truth is you know that the, the you know christendom in the west you know demonized jewish folk <laughs> you know pure plain yeah. and simple and, and i would say important. when you when you say that people for i mean um let's remember again comes back to facts jesus of nazareth was a jew <laughs> who lived his life as a jew most yes. teaching Judaism mostly to other Jews. He wasn't Christian. That religion did not exist at that at that point. Um, and so the notion that we are responsible um, for what the Romans did. Yes, there was a role that the Jewish community played in handing Jesus over to the Romans. I'm not denying that that troubling part of the story. But the notion that gets passed down for for centuries, Jews are Christ killers. They murdered God. That that gets a lot of resonance. And suddenly, when people are looking for who to blame for a plague, for financial hardship, for other problems, they they turn to the familiar scapegoat of the Jews. So this is not just a political issue right. or a social issue. Um, it is a religious issue. And how Christians reconcile themselves to this is incredibly important because in some ways, there's incredible healing that has transpired. Right. But there's also incredible harm that continues to get done. Um, the whole notion that God's love no longer rests on the Jews, it's only on Christianity. We're your older siblings. We got to get along. <laughs> and, and blaming each other or blaming one group never ends well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the supersessionism theology is, is pretty bogus. And, uh, and as you said, I mean, there's a central problem in, in Christian faith that separates Jesus from his Jewishness, you know, that leads to all sorts of, you know, well, what, all the atrocities that we're already naming and talking about, right? You know, so, um, so yeah, I appreciate um, you adding those different components, uh, Rabbi Shalom. The second question is around uh, interfaith uh, mutual uh, allyship. So, you know, we, you know, much has been stated about the partnership right, that has existed between segments of the Jewish population and segments of the black population, most notably during the, the civil rights movement. And one of the central figures, uh, uh, you know, people reference around this allyship is that of Rab- Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. And so from your vantage point, um, from just your understanding of, of history, uh, what was the nature of black Jewish relationships during the civil rights struggle? And what is the nature of our two groups relationships today? Uh, mm. How has you uh, stepped into this work around, you know, interfaith uh, dialogue uh, in your context? It's another very uh, potent uh, question and a very important question. You know, it saddened me in one of the recent films about the civil rights movement that the role of Jews in uh, Rabbi Abraham Josh Heschel was completely removed. Um, he literally marched with a uh, Dr. Pastor Martin Luther, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, he was not um, some peripheral figure. Um, uh, Jewish individuals uh, founded the NAACP. This has been something that the Jewish community has been committed to for a very long time. Unfortunately, in recent decades, there's been a bit of a schism between the communities and we're working really hard, uh, some of us, to restore those ties. It's important to understand, because this is a conversation ultimately about justice and and identity, um, one can be black and Jewish. 
Um, look, obviously the whole notion of race is being debated by scientists. It really is a social construct much more than a physiological one. Uh, and, I, and I want to be clear with, that I feel that way. Um, to the extent that race exists, it has to do with common uh, physical features. Jews are not a race. Jews are a culture. Jews are an ethnicity. We also happen to be religion, but we're much more a culture. And I'll get into this maybe later in the conversation because one can be a proud Jew and not practice the tenets of the faith. Um, it's, it's a family identity. So I want to make it clear that when we have dialogues, including ones um, that are happening right now in the Central Valley, um, with support from the faith in the Valley, um, it's a black and or Jewish conversation because they're not two different groups. It's an overlapping group. There are black Jews. Um, not all Jews are white. In fact, historically, Jews were not considered white. Uh, the Jews of Europe were considered ethnically and racially Jewish because originally we are from the Middle East. Um, and it's interesting, many Jews from Europe, even though it's been 2000 years since their ancestors lived in the Middle East, literally have darker skin and, and often Middle Eastern features. Um, so I realize that this is confusing, but that's okay. Life is confusing. It's okay for, for something to be complicated and unpack it. Um, so let me be clear that, that Jews are an ethnicity and a culture, and there is a religion called Judaism. And the reason that that's confusing is that anti-Semitism, which again is anti-Jewish oppression, uh, hatred of Jews, is described as a form of racism. And because Jews have been on the receiving end of that of that oppression, it was natural for us uh, in the, it, for literally hundreds of years to turn to other oppressed people and say, how do we work together? Um, the way that Jews arrived in this country and the way that that African Americans arrived in this country are incredibly different. Jews arrived here largely seeking freedom and opportunity. The ancestors of today's African American community were brought here as slaves. So I in no way wish to say that those are un, that those are equal stories. They're very different stories. But they tended to live as recent incomers in terms of the Jewish community in um, neighborhoods with other ethnic minorities. As different ways of refugees came through, uh, they they tended to settle in inner urban areas um, and quickly found themselves in immediate proximity with next door neighbors to uh, black Americans. Um, and by the way, Harlem used to be a Jewish neighborhood in addition to being a black neighborhood in, in New York City. And there's many examples of this across the country. So to me, this was a fundamental effort based on a guiding principle of Judaism. One, which is that God is oneness, not just one, but oneness which means there is nothing in the universe that is not part of God. This is a deep, important theological underpinning of, the, of this work, working against racism, that God is in all places, God is in all things, God is in all moments, God is in all people. All people are made in the image of God. All people have a spark of the divine. All people are inherently worthy of and deserving and require basic human dignity, freedom, respect, etc. So I believe that this was not only coming from those theological um, imperatives, but a second one, a basic piece of Jewish religion and culture, what's called tikkun olam, repairing the world, healing the world, fixing the world, partnering with God if you believe in God or partnering with your fellow if you don't. doesn't matter what the inspiration is, you still have to do the work, which is to make the world a better place for everyone, period, end of paragraph. That's, that's one of Judaism's ultimate um, goals is how do we make the world better for everyone? So it's clear that looking in the, into the 1950s and 1960s of America, there was something wrong. And Jews who largely had been a successful refugee population turned to their neighbors and said, this is a wrong that needs to be made right. Um, and it's a complicated story because there were Jews that lived in the South that fought on the side of the Confederacy. Um, the majority of Jews in the United States at that point were living um, actually in the South, but ultimately it's the Jewish communities of the North because of the refugee populations that became the, the dominant um, population. And Jews have a very long orientation uh, towards progressive causes the desire for there to be an end to oppression in general and part and building alliances. 
So I think that those were the motivations of, of um, people like Rabbi Abram Joshua Heschel and like the founders of the NAACP and the, the hundreds, the thousands of people um, who literally risked their lives, including those that were murdered for their activism within the civil rights movement, um, a fundamental imperative, how do we make this better for everyone? And then unfortunately, some things went down, uh, mostly in New York City um, in the 80s and 90s that pitted these two communities against each other. Um, and uh, you know, some of them were seemed like minor incidents, but they, they quickly spread. So for example, there was a, a funeral um, entourage, a procession that um, and a, 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 a black individual was, was hit by this, this funeral procession. And that started uh, some riots um, because the community right next to Bedford Stuy is Crown Heights. And Crown Heights is primarily Hasidic Jews. Bedford Stuy at the time of this incident primarily blacks, African Americans. And tension happened because of not only the traffic incident, which was horrible, but the way that the police responded. The police seemed to think, oh, we need to protect the Jews. We need to oppress, you know, the, the blacks. Um, and so there was a bit of a rising up against. Um, the man, in this case, the, the policing of, uh, in New York City, and that that incident and a few others like it began to drift these communities apart. And people continue to say, oh, remember uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and Abram Joshua Heschel, but it became a meme more than a reality. People stopped making those connections. Um, people stopped understanding that oppression is a Jewish story. Um, too many blacks began to understand that Jews are people of privilege. They're not oppressed. Um, they're the oppressors. And uh, too many Jews also forgot their understanding that, no, we continue to be an oppressed people and we have to stand with others. And as always, political powers did their best job to divide people rather than bring them together. Thankfully, the effort never um, was fully successful to divide these communities. And there are a number of grassroots efforts happening, certainly here in town, but in other places, putting people back into conversation, putting people back into learning about each other, putting people back to understanding how do we stand together. And I draw a lot of strength from the fact that the, the story of the Exodus from Egypt is not only the foundational story of Judaism, but has become a foundational story of, of standing up against oppression all over the world. And I love that we have this common language. And I love that we have a common sense of, of how to organize, but now we need to organize beyond our block, beyond our community. We need to organize with a community one block over or 10 blocks over. Um, we need to, as I said before, the antidote, education, learning about each other, understanding the facts understanding that Jews are not oppressors and understanding that blacks in this country are feeling oppressed. Unfortunately, politics has a way of driving people apart. So the board for the movement for black lives has come out with some pretty disturbing statements about Jews and Israel. And I keep needing to tell my own Jewish community, the movement for black lives and the statement black lives matter are not two identical things. Black lives matter, 100%. And whatever, obviously, I mean, one shouldn't even need to say that. And the issues that people may have with the leadership of the movement for Black Lives needs to be separated by the need to stand up um, for what are real needs in our community regarding policing, regarding profiling, regarding divisions in our society. So I, I remain hopeful, but it takes a lot of work. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a whole conversation in of in and of itself. Yes, um, it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a couple things. Yeah, what, um, as you name the Exodus story, uh, and as you know, the Exodus story is also you know it's a foundational story for Black Protestantism. You know, where that's a central motif around you know um, you know the liberation from slavery and the formation of Black religious communities and Black uh, Christian identities here in the United States. And so that's just a, such a, an important story for. Um, religious folks and even non-religious folks, I, I think, could reflect upon that story as you know a, a tool of understanding how to perform in a way to stand with oppressed oppressed peoples and oppressed populations. I think that's I think that's critical critically important. I think there's a, a larger conversation around um, 
the, the the critical analysis that many black organizers and activists uh, are are laying out around abolition and the connection between you know the domestic oppression of black communities by the police and then the connections to larger um, international military forces and the connections between the United States and Israel. I think that's a a, a, lar a much larger kind of conversation to to, uh, to unpack um, and. I think as as people are navigating and thinking about the question around Israel and Palestine and uh, Israel's relationship with the U.S. empire, is to what if you're a, a critic of um, Israeli activity in the region that we don't fall back into anti-Semitism because anti-Semitism is sort of always lurking like right beneath the surface in the modern world uh, in, in a similar in a similar way, not in the same, but in a similar way as how anti-Blackness is always lurking in, in the modern world. And I think they're very, very similar. Yeah. I would say that, that the, first of all, I'm so glad we're naming an, ele an elephant in the room and I want to say a little bit more about it, but I think these two tendencies of hatred and othering are almost always present and often overlapping. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at, look, look at white supremacy which targets blacks and Jews, look at the KKK, look at a different attempts of profiling, and you will see these two sinister forces working together. Look, the elephant in the room is, Israel's not a perfect country. Certainly the United States is not a perfect country. I can think of no perfect, perfect country in the world. Um, the problem is, is not when people criticize particular Israeli government um, responses or policies, it's when that so quickly becomes Israel has no right to exist or Israel is a Nazi government or Israel is an apartheid government. That's a completely inaccurate analogy because apartheid was a systematic um, concept of racism imposed by colonial rule. Jews are indigenous to the land of Judea, the land of Israel, as are the Palestinians. You cannot be um, conducting apartheid, and let me make this more clear, the Afrikaners never said they were returning to their ancestral homeland. They knew they were not. It was a colonial enterprise. Israel is not a colonial enterprise. It is Jews returning to their homeland. And how that land is, is shared, lived in, and divided between its Jewish, its Muslim, its Christian um, Bru Druze and Baha'i uh, residents is an important question. One can challenge Israel without challenging its rights to exist. One can challenge Israeli policy without using Jewish stereotypes, anti-Semitic language, or buying into Jewish oppression. And not only can we, we have to. Mm -hmm. So when the movement for Black Lives, which again is separate from the mass movement of Black Lives Matter, which I fully support that movement and have participated in, when the initial board for, for Black Lives says that Israel is the main provider of, 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 of um, oppression in, in the Middle East, that's an absurdly hateful statement. <laughs> First of all, they single out Israel, the, that's the only international country that they were focused on. And that's somehow to say that what Israel does, which is maybe in, not perfect and maybe even unjust, but that somehow is, is more damaging than, than what happens in, in Yemen what happens in parts of the world where literally people don't have rights, 20% of the citizens of Israel are non-Jews. They have rights, they have votes, they're represented in the government, they're represented in the Supreme Court. That is not apartheid, A, because Jews are not a race, and B, because they're returning to their homeland, and thirdly, because it is a democracy, even though a struggling one. So what needs to happen is more conversations like this, that people get to say, I am a proud Jew. I believe in the rights for Jews to have national expression, and I'm going to work against anti-Black oppression. Those, those things can be stated fully and equally. I don't need to check my love of Israel at the door to work for progressive movements, and I should not have to be expected to. And that's, a, that's unfortunate issue. Too. Oh, you're Jewish, that's fine. Oh, you're a Zionist? Zionism is simply the right for Jews to have national expression. If Canadians can love Canada and um, Italians can love Italy and Americans can love America, Jews can, can love the fact that they're part of a nation and a people. But immediately it becomes linked in with racism 
or or not really being um, um, solidly part of the nations that we live in, dual dual loyalties, and suddenly the whole conversation gets shut down rather than opened up. Let's ask the hard questions. Mm -hmm. Let's listen to each other. Let's talk Israel Palestine, but do it without engaging in, in, in oppression. <laughs> without, re, without recourse to, to hateful language. And yeah, I, 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 would, I would add from, uh, from a non-Jewish perspective for folks who, uh, for um, particularly speaking, speaking about black communities who organize, as we are critical of um, Israeli actions towards Palestinian folks, that we shouldn't also be named anti-Semitic because we're critical of political or military. And exactly. It goes both ways. Not only should I not need to check my identity and love at the door, neither should someone need to check their political causes at the door. But I'll let, let me mention two things on this topic, and I know we'll move on to some other related questions. One is I was uh, there was a play that was put on in town, and it had in it anti-Jewish and anti-Black themes, um, very powerful themes of, of oppression. And so I was asked to be part of a talk, and also Muslim. It was literally about race. Jews and Muslims, there was a lot in this play. Um, and I was asked to be part of a, of a response panel along with my dear friend, Imam Ahmed from the Islamic Center Modesto and someone I believe from the NAACP or, or some other um, group, I, I don't remember the specifics, but I, I do remember this, the first question of the audience was, I don't understand why the rabbi is there. Jews are not an oppressed people. Hmm. And my jaw dropped. You know, the, again, the notion that, well, maybe in the Holocaust, but not now, Jews are still an oppressed people. Um, the notion that, um, that we are all people of means is itself a form of oppression. Oh, all Jews are wealthy. All <laughs> Jews are white. All Jews are powerful. That actually has a little bit of anti-Semitism embedded inside those statements. That's number one. Number two, when people say, well, tell me about Israel, I say, what Israel are you talking about? The land, its people, its history, or its government? Because I can really connect with one, two, or three of those and not the fourth and still have a strong relationship. And that's no different than my orientation towards the United States. Mm. I love this country and its potential. I love its landscapes. I love its people. I love its history of literally welcoming people from all over the world. I am not comfortable with its policies towards Native Americans. I am not comfortable towards its policing of the black community. I'm not comfortable with many aspects of its governance, but I still love this country. So again, we can, we can discuss something, warts and all, but let's do it thoughtfully, not excluding Jews or saying, oh, here's, here's a gay rights event but you can't have a, a, a Star of David because that's the symbol of oppression. No, that's the symbol of my people. Mm -hmm. Again, there's a lot to this and we're just kind of touching the surface, but I'm glad that we actually went below the surface yeah. into some of the nitty gritty. Now, there, yeah, this, that's, that's, yeah, I have another question, but there's offline, I would love to continue this, this dialogue because um, I think that there's a lot of conversation around this as it pertains to organizing in the Central Valley, you know what I mean? This is such an important conversation, which I'm so glad that we're naming some yeah. of the elephants in the room. Yeah, uh, indeed, I appreciate you. I appreciate you, appreciated your in-depth response. There's some things I need to think and consider. Uh, so I appreciate uh, the way the way you, fr you frame some of your response there. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's always an interesting piece for me because when I have these conversations, we have structured questions and there's only an hour <laughs> worth of time to talk about things that, you know, you know, you can, you know, you can literally, you know, get a, a PhD, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> one segment from each one of these questions, you know what I mean? So. That's true. <laughs> well, it's, it's great to engage in all of these questions. So let, let's keep going. So, there, so there's two more questions and you touched on this already a little bit around sort of the, the interplay between um, Jewish identity and, and Judaism as a religion and faith orientation. So the two questions are, uh, what is the relationship between Jewish identity and Jewish religious beliefs? Uh, and here I'm thinking about how uh, Jewish people in the United States navigate their Jewish identity and the tension between resisting and being subsumed into the category of whiteness within America's racial 
social landscape. And the second piece is how does the study uh, or interpretations of the Hebrew Bible inform not only Jewish identity in the world, but also Jewish political activity. Uh, this, that's my son Cairo to everyone. He has a, an ice cream cone and he said all gone because he ate it all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad that he's part of the conversation as well, truly. Um, so let's see how I can cover this in, in the time that we have left. Great questions. Um, as I said, yes, it's confusing because there's a religion called Judaism and Jews are also part of a culture and an ethnicity. These are overlapping identities. Someone can. Hold on one second. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> he kept touching the, the keyboard. He, th he thought it was funny. Sorry to interrupt, Rob. No, that's great. I, now it makes me want some ice cream. I want to hang out with him and have, have some ice cream. Um, Judaism is, is both a religion. There's a religion called, called Cause Judaism, a, a very complex, beautiful, and diverse faith, Reform, conservative, orthodox, Hasidic, etc., etc. And we are part of a culture and an ethnicity. And here's where it gets interesting. They're overlapping identities rather than exactly symmetrical in the sense that someone can be a proud Jew. They're proud of their culture. They're proud of their ethnicity. They're part of their culture and not necessarily follow the tenets of Judaism. And someone can be born uh, not Jewish, a completely different ethnicity and culture or, 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 or racial makeup, DNA makeup, if you will, and convert to Judaism and be 100% Jewish. So in other words, someone can be Jewish and not practicing the, the um, religion of Judaism, and someone can be practicing the religion of Judaism and not initially be from the culture and ethnicity of Judaism. So I realize that's a little bit complicated. We don't fit into any of the, the pegs. When people always say, you know, what's your race? I literally check other and write Ashkenazi Jew because yes, I can pass as white. I'm well aware of that privilege. I'm well aware that I will not be pulled over by a police officer in this country, less maybe in particular areas of the South because I look Jewish, because I can, I can take this kippah, this yarmulke off and put on a ball cap and pass as white. And I'm aware that that's an important privilege for me not to take for granted, because that's not something that, a, that a, a black American or a black Jewish American can do. They can't take off their skin color. So yes, we this incredibly complicated intersection of race, culture, faith, religion, that equals identity. But on the other hand, that's true for most of us. Identity is not just this was my mother, this was my father. It's our political orientations. It's what we do in our free time. Are we a parent? Are we a sibling? Um, am I straight? Am I gay? Do I believe in this faith? Do I believe it? So we're all we're all an amalgamation of things. Judaism just happens to have that built in. But one of the things that makes this confusing is we are still an oppressed people, even though in America, most Jews are people of of means, that does not mean that historically that is true. And that doesn't mean that all over the world that is true. So for example, as recently as a couple decades ago, there were more than a million Russian Jews who were being persecuted because they were Jews. And Russia was also saying, you're not allowed to leave. When they finally were allowed to leave, partially you know, with, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, a million of them moved, um, sorry, a million of them moved to Israel and a couple hundred thousand moved to the United States. But that, that's in, in recent decades. There are literally places in the world that Jews are still experiencing oppression today, such as Iran. Uh, imagine what it is to be Jewish under a leadership that literally threatens to wipe the one Jewish majority nation off the map. Um, and basically they, they're constantly having to, to prove, no, 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 we're true Iranians. Um, and we're not Zionists. We don't love Israel. We don't care about Jews in other places because we're, we're, we're good Iranians. Um, yes, I want to be clear that is not the case in the United States, but that doesn't mean that that's not the case in many other places in the world. We're including in the United States anti-Jewish violence is at unprecedented numbers. 
Um, there are neighborhoods, even in New York City, which has a large Jewish population, that people are not comfortable identifying as Jewish. They're putting their, their ball caps over their, their kippot, their yarmulkes when they walk to a synagogue. They're tucking in their Star of David because literally people have been spit on, people have been knifed, people have been shot. We've had synagogues assaulted with people being killed simply because they were Jews. So it's not only an active oppression, but we have PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, not only from the Holocaust, but from the 2000 years that led up to it. So yes, there's a tremendous, I, I love the way you phrased the question, the tensions between resisting and being subsumed. Um, those are very real tensions. When I see what's going on in, in, in the United States, part of me says, phew, this is one battle I don't need to directly face until I'm reminded, no, I'm directly facing it with what happened in Pittsburgh, what happened in Poway, what even happened here in Modesto in terms of white supremacist flyers being placed on our back gate, on a church, um, on a local congressman's town hall meeting, and on the Pride Center. And in each of those cases, those flyers were hand, uh, not only hand posted, but the message on them was delivered to match the organization that it was going on. So there is there is white supremacist hatred of Jews right here in the Central Valley, let alone across the country, let alone across the world, which is why we have to stand together. All oppressed peoples have to make alliances with other oppressed people and non oppressed people to end this hatred and oppression once and for all and rise above what has plagued us as, as humans for thousands of years. In terms of them, a little bit about the Hebrew Bible and, and, and what, how does it inspire identity and political activism. Um, the words of the prophets, to quote Simon and Garfunkel, are written on the subway walls. They, uh, they appear to be more relevant today than maybe even at the time that they were written in. Um, there's incredible inspiration from understanding that people have felt a divine calling to make the world a better place, to work for justice, to work for freedom, to end hatred for literally thousands of years. The most repeated line in the Torah 36 times is not the Ten Commandments, is not about the oneness of God, is not about our holidays, our culture. It's the following. Do not mistreat mistreat the stranger for you were a stranger that's the most repeated line in the entire five books of moses which is the central text of the hebrew bible um, what christians call the old testament the central faith of jewish religion and cultural expression for literally more than three thousand years is a text that says what's the bottom line do not mistreat the stranger because you were a stranger you were a foreigner you've been oppressed we need to say, we've lived through this. We've been living through it for 3000 years. We're living through it today. How do I respond with love, with compassion, with a clear vision of a world of justice, not just for me, but for everyone. Raise every ship in the harbor and we can do this. It is doable. I'm 100% convinced that the problems that are facing our world are solvable by human um, intelligence and human partnership. Yeah, that's a, a great word to, to close us out on, Rabbi Shalom. I really appreciate this kind this conversation. This kind of on the edge because there's so much to, <laughs> still to kind of to kind of talk about. Um, but I really appreciate the last framework around uh, the key tenet in Judaism around welcoming the stranger, right? I mean, and that, that's something that as, as a Christian, I'm, I'm drawn to, most drawn to the prophets. And even my understanding of the life and ministry of Jesus is within the tradition of the, prop, the Hebrew prophets. And so I always, you know, I'm, I'm drawn to, uh, uh, to Amos and to Isaiah and to, you know, and to, and to, to all Jeremiah, all, all, all of these folks. Um, who just have such a keen um, analysis of power and such so just a, a real critical um, uh, takedown of uh, idolatry and how that forms an oppressive society. And so I, I feel like there's just there's so much to continue to to learn from the wisdom of the Hebrew prophets that they penned, you know, many thousand, many, many millennia ago. <laughs> you know, there's a reason they call it the good book. Yeah, <laughs> it, there's a, it's a good book. 
and there's a lot in there to constantly revisit. And look, I'm glad this conversation has touched more questions. That's good. That, that, that's a healthy Jewish conversation if it leaves us with more questions than we started with. Uh, that's right. Everyone, uh, Rabbi Shalom uh, from uh, Modesto, uh, we're going to house this conversation on the Faith in the Valley webpage. And uh, I'm going to ask Rabbi Shalom to email the three resources that he outlined so we can place that in the description for uh, for folks who uh, need to, uh, to 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 research around how anti-Semitism functions uh, and, its, and, its, and its rise that's continuing in, in, in the world uh, currently. So we appreciate uh, Rabbi Shalom for, uh, for the conversation and we look forward to and maybe even down the line, bringing him back and 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 just sitting on one question and having a <laughs> and having a dialogue there. So uh, so much appreciated, Rabbi Shalom. I appreciate you, and um, we'll 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 speak soon. If you can, if you can hang on after I click out the calls, we can kind of wrap up amongst ourselves. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Peace.